Welcome to Better Sex, where you get the information and inspiration to create and enjoy your best possible sex life. Join your host, sex therapist Jessa Zimmerman, as she brings you expert guests, helpful tips, knowledge, and strategies to improve your intimate relationships. And now, your host, Jessa Zimmerman. Hey, it's Jessa. Welcome back to another episode of the Better Sex Podcast. So glad you've tuned in and are choosing to spend a little bit of time with me. Uh, Today's episode falls into, I guess, the pillar of intimacy with ease that I think of as a line. Right? Where you learn to be a really good partner, teammate with your partner, where you work on communication, where you build trust, where you commit to a win-win, right? Where you're on the same page, on the same team, which is such a crucial part of, you know, any and relationship really, but it, it's certainly a part of creating a thriving partnership, creating a sex life that's going to be easy and fun for both of you, right? You've got to be teammates. You cannot be competitors or opponents. And Dr. Gina Senarigi joins me today. We actually went to grad school today. It's really fun to reconnect with her because we haven't spoken in a few years now. And she's published a book called Love More, Fight Less. And man, we cover a lot in this interview because we're talking about We're talking about all kinds of relationships. What's it mean to be an expansive relationship? How do you expand yours uh, beyond where you might have found yourself these days? We're talking about building intimacy and what that that takes, what intimacy even is. How do we grow that with our partner? And then tying that to communication, which is so crucial in terms of developing a partnership, right? And really having your relationship thrive. So we're all over the place with this stuff. I hope you get a ton out of the show and that you really enjoy the conversation. And before we start the show today, it is sponsored by Intimacy with Ease. It's a method to help otherwise happy couples achieve a sex life that is easy and fun for both of them. So you can actually just enjoy your sex life with zero stress. For more information, if you want to watch a brief little training video that's available, all of that, go to intimacywithease.com. Gina, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show. Thank you for having me. It's, it's really, just, it's so fun to so reconnect, you know, having yeah. gone, <laughs> been in grad school together and not actually having spoken to you in, I don't know, it's been a few years now. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think we've had a couple of like points when we've been able to touch base at different trainings and things, but it's been over 10 years, right? Since we graduated at like, right? Isn't it a 10 yeah, year? Yeah, 20, yeah, 2010, yeah. It's been yeah, so... <laughs> Here we are at our decade check-in point. (laughs) Right, exactly. Every 10 years we'll get together. Yeah. So do you want to give just a little quick overview of what's your journey been over these 10 years from master's master's to mastery, right? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I left school and I think you remember, and the thing is still true in the world of mental health therapy, there's a very specific small population of us who really like couples and relationship work. Yeah. Right. Like there's a lot of folks doing great things and they're, they have their other specializations, but I remember you and I being two of a small number of us <laughs> leaving saying we want to do couples and relationships and we want to do sex. Right. <laughs> like We want to talk about those things with people for sure. And for me at that point, um, I was working at a, at a LGBTQ specific, um, agency in Seattle, um, and doing a lot of work with queer, um, folks and folks in the BDSM community. And I was learning a lot personally and professionally about polyamory and consensual non-monogamy. And so I really geeked out about that. Um, and dove into a lot of training and um, specialized for almost almost this whole last 10 years in working with less mainstream or traditional relationships, couples who kind of 
or triads or quads who color a little outside the lines um, <laughs> of what's what's considered normal. And it's been really, really fun. And then there've been sort of byproducts of that, um, that I didn't anticipate doing a lot of work about affairs and um, affair repair and infidelity. But that's one of the routes a lot of people take to come to a discussion about does consensual non-monogamy work for them, right? Should they open their relationship? Well, I've always, I've never believed people could be faithful or I don't believe monogamy works. So, and so I've done a lot of work kind of by accident in infidelity and affairs. You're nodding. Maybe you've done some of that too. Yeah, it shows up, right? It (laughs) does. Yes. And there is this other component of the work that's come up where there are some people who come to the conversation about consensual non-monogamy because they're really ready to not choose to be together. (laughs) And it's not even so much about opening our relationship. It's about like um, separating and detangling our relationship in in some ways, right? And often those are folks who really like each other or get along pretty well or have like a great family life or a, a lucrative business together but they maybe aren't feeling romantic or sexual and they don't want to invest energy into, <laughs> into doing that together. So that has then like grown into this other component of my work. That's been a lot of something called discernment counseling, where people are deciding if they want to stay together and do some work on all these components of their relationship, or do they want to separate in some ways and create more individual paths and conscious uncoupling where people are trying to think about either divorce or separation in a really compassionate way. Yeah. So those were kind of two byproducts of this, this work that I didn't anticipate going into it, but has certainly been a large component of the work that I've been doing. Can I tell you one more? Yeah. Part that's come up <laughs> more recently. I really like one other thing that has happened is I, I get a lot of folks who maybe monogamy is the best option for them but they want to at least have a discussion about what do we do when there's somebody one of us has a crush on or one of us gets inspired or how do we make sure we have really fulfilling, deeply intimate friendships that don't threaten our relationship. Often they're folks who are on a second marriage or have come out of a long-term relationship that maybe didn't support their whole complex self and relationships. So they're wanting to do that. Um, and that's really fun because it's super proactive. These are folks right. who are like, <laughs> okay, I've learned some things in my last patterned relationship. What do I, what do I want to do now? And that's pretty, that's pretty fun setup work or like proactive work with people yeah. about relationships. Yeah. Did so I that, answer your question? Yeah, what have I yeah. done for 10 years? <laughs> <laughs> Not that you've been busy at all or anything, because I know that's even only a slice <laughs> of what you've been doing. But so does this lead into what you put on your website now about expansive relationships? I mean, I'd love to hear a little bit about yeah. that terminology and the journey towards that as opposed to non-traditional or whatever else people might say. Well, I yeah, I've I've always struggled with what do I call this like coloring outside the lines group of people that I that I work with, right? Because it's a quite diverse group of people. It's sort of like folks who either explicitly or accidentally find themselves outside of a norm, right? Right. And it's really hard to define that without um, normalizing certain behavior as like this is, you know, being heterosexual um, and monogamous is the right way to do relationships. I'm going to center that if I say, alternative because it's yeah. alternative to that right or right yeah and so I've I've always kind of struggled with what to call that and very recently um right around when the book was getting published this year I had this realization that most of what I'm doing even if it's the discernment work or uncoupling work with people or even working with folks who choose to stay monogamous is about kind of expanding our relationships to in, to include more of our whole self and really support all of these intimacy needs that we all have, not just sexual intimacy and not just romantic, but our emotional intimacy needs, our intellectual intimacy needs, right? And And so for some people, that expansion means like expanding beyond being two of us in relationship. We're going to be polyamorous or we're going to have a threesome. So sometimes it's like sexual expansion uh, or we're going to, there's lots of things over there we can do, right? Right. right. <laughs> or, or it's an expansive, like, oh, we have become so enmeshed 
the two of us that neither of us see our own friends anymore. And I haven't invested in my hobbies a long time. So we need to expand from that. Like we are everything to each other all the time to how do we create a little bit more room for us to nourish our whole selves, right? Or even expanding, like we've realized the agreements we had together, our commitments don't work anymore for us. And maybe we want to divorce or separate or co-parent and nest in some really kind way. How do we expand this relationship for a lot more autonomy and individual living and still maintain some loving connection or trustworthy, you know, reliable commitments to each other? Like, I'll still pick up the kids at three and you can, get, you know, when I say I will um, call the landscapers, I will call them for us, right? Like <laughs> um, there are ways that we still show up for each other. Yeah. So I've really, I've loved that idea of expansion and expansive relationships. It's not like a great SEO term, like not a lot of people look for it that <laughs> right, way. Right. They're not, that's not their Google search query, right? Yeah. Yeah. But I've landed on that and it feels really, it feels like a really lovely way to encompass a lot of the work I do with people. Yeah. 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 What do you think goes into, um, I mean, it's sort of a big question, but what constricts people? I think of that as sort of the opposite mm. of expansion is constricted and like how, Oh, good question. Goes, you know, what are you saying that are some of the blocks to expansiveness or caught people in such a small, tight and meshed yeah. place? Well, we're all loaded up with stories, um, some of them from outside of us and some of them we create all on our own, right? But when I say stories, I mean like our um, society teaches us a lot of things about what is right or wrong or good or bad or healthy or unhealthy in relationship. And some of those stories aren't accurate. Um, and they cert- <laughs> Yeah. And they right. certainly aren't custom tailored, right? Like each of us are individual people with our own histories and you know, eccentricities. And, and we, um, so we need different things that kind of cookie cutters, one social st- construct of what relationship is, doesn't always fit for everybody in the exact same way. So one part is kind of unpacking some of those stories about, you know, like, I'll, I have lots of couples who identify as heterosexual, but they have a threesome every so often with a same sex partner or, and so, you know, that, it doesn't quite fit within the cookie cutter normative. Like we only have sex with one person of the opposite gender who we are committed to norm right? yeah, yeah. after a certain amount of time, right? Like there's a whole bunch of stories about who, when, and where we have sex. Right. right? So the stories limit us, right? They can box us in potentially. Yeah. Yeah. And then I learned some of those explicitly or implicitly from my family growing up or from my community growing up. And I teach myself some of them, right? So I have experiences through my life that um, I begin to create stories about, right? Like, so I'll, I make a mistake in, I don't know, in my friendships in elementary school, and I'm socially kind of shamed about it. I start to think, oh, these behaviors that I had aren't safe or might lead to hurt and, um, and I'll avoid them <laughs> moving forward when maybe it was that context or maybe it was that age group or maybe it was that day. Yeah. Um, and if I start to get curious about those stories, I can kind of unpack and be a little bit more intentional about how I'm relating and showing up authentically with people now. Cause sometimes the stories work okay. Right. Or it might not, if, you know, it's just that there's these default, I talk about this in the book a little bit, like we, we get settled into these sort of default settings that we don't really think about how, right. how we operate with other people. And it doesn't mean they're right or wrong, but the less we think about them, the more likely we are to do harm or, or, you know, carelessly, um, you know, ignore ourselves when you ask mm-hmm. about what, what constricts us over compromising myself or not listening to my voice. Yeah. It's certainly part of that. Right. Yeah. I think yeah. of it as, as, you know, it can be so hard to see the water we swim in, you know, fish are not yeah. aware of the water. So it's like, if we don't, you know, sort of yeah. step back and think about what are we swimming in? How is that shaping us? Like what's on autopilot really mm-hmm. as opposed to challenging some of this? Yeah. Yeah. And just because we challenge it doesn't mean it, it we have to scrap it, right? right, like right, we right. Can, <laughs> but let's at least look at it and explore it and check out, does it still fit for me? I mean, so often, I'm sure you see this too folks kind of get into setting up their norms somewhere in the first year or two of their being together in relationship. And maybe we talk about them rarely, but maybe we talk about them then. And then we don't usually revisit 
right, for an entirety of a relationship. And I think a lot of the work in coming into couples work is looking at what are those defaults and are they are they working for us? Do they need adjustments? Can we custom tailor this to yeah. fit this era of our life? Uh, because just because it fit when we met doesn't mean it still fits now. Right. It's its own form yeah. of discernment counseling, I guess, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> discernment yeah. about those stories and which ones are always which discerning. Ones right. Yeah, we're always discerning something. <laughs> so how do you... Um, I guess I want to ask you, how do you define intimacy? Like you were, you, you know, I think that you, that might be the overarching word you use for your work is intimacy yeah. work, right? Yeah. And like, how do you even define that? How do you frame that? What do you think people's struggles are? Oof. I know, just That's small questions question. for you. <laughs> I know, right? I mean, I, you know, there's the intimacy that's the felt sense, right? Like I feel close. Um, and open, I think, seen and known by another, right? Like, and there are, of course, sort of like layers to it, right? There's a surface level of intimacy I might feel with lots of people. I know my neighbors across the street. I know that I'll see them on Wednesdays when they take out their trash. And there's like a familial intimacy there. It is certainly not the depth of intimacy that I have with my partner of 12 Mm -hmm. years, right? Like we see each other every day and have built up patterns and asked lots of questions and been through moments of intense vulnerability together and vulnerability and intimacy aren't the same, but handling vulnerability with care can really deepen intimacy. Mm. I think about, you know, even the folks in our, in our graduate class, we did a lot of vulnerable work, right? Asking each other very intimate details, very specific personal details of our histories Um, and working on emotional reactivity or surprises that were coming up in our lives. That's really vulnerable work. Mm -hmm. And feeling the sense of being known or understood or appreciated, not necessarily agreed with, but appreciated (laughs) through that, right, really deepens intimacy within a group of people. So I don't know that I'm clearly defining it because, because it can mean something different for different people, right? But I think about that felt sense of deep connection with people and understanding. How would you define it? It's a huge part of your work. It is a huge part of my work. And I sort of lean towards the way David Snarsh defines it, which is Mm -hmm. it's really about letting yourself be seen and known, good Mm -hmm. and bad, and less about reciprocal, you know, like Mm -hmm. trade. I'll show you mine if you show me yours. It's like, it's (laughs) a little bit more unilateral about it's very intimate. Mm -hmm. You know, I reveal myself. And and, yeah, uh, there's so much masking or hiding of our worst parts, you know, so often. Mm -hmm. And so it's also intimate to sort of, be the morning monster or whatever, right? Like just really truly yeah. ourselves. So I love that. I love that there's a talk. Um, I often ask my clients to watch Brene Brown did a talk about the seven pillars of trust. What it what is it? The anatomy of trust is the name of her talk. And she talks through like several of the the key components of the research about what builds trust in relationships. And trust and intimacy tend to go hand in hand. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's one part that I've always felt was left out. And that is the the discernment of like, oh, I need to feel physically and emotionally safe in order to open myself, like you were saying, right? And that for all of us, there are these kind of varying levels of how safe is it for me to be open here, right? It might be diff- there might be different risk factors, let's say for me to be totally open about myself at work than in my living room yeah. or with my, you know, parent who was abusive than with my current best friend. Right. And I really think about that. I love that you talking about that, like how much can I open myself? And I sometimes think there can be a pressure on people that you should be more open. We should mm-hmm. just be open all the time. And you know, I'm, from our work, there are plenty of times when folks want to be more open and there are barriers coming up that they want to work through. Yeah. And there are also plenty of very practical times when people aren't as open yeah. <laughs> for deeper intimacy, right? Again, we'll also throw the word discernment around a bunch in this episode. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because that's all discernment too of like, you know, what is helping me feel open? What cultivates that sense of openness for me? What sorts of behaviors can I look for in other people or environments can I look for that help me cultivate that openness? Yeah. 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 Hey, 
Okay, we're going to just take a short little break here, and I want to let you know about Intimacy with Ease, the method that helps otherwise happy couples create a sex life that is fun, easy, light for both people. So if you are an otherwise happy couple, if sex is the elephant in the room or sex is the little bit of the challenge for you guys, you may want to check this out. Uh, you can go to intimacywithease.com and you'll see information there. You'll see short videos. You'll have access to a full webinar about it. All kinds of information to let you know if this would be the right thing for you. So talk a little bit about the book because mm. what made you write it? <laughs> I guess. Yeah, right? <laughs> Where did that come from? And yeah. it's got a real focus on communication, right? I mean, I know, yeah. I mean, we both know this is, is couples counselors, like almost everybody comes in saying we need to work on our communication. It's a communication mm -hmm. skills issue, which is mm -hmm. related, I think, to the actual work and important, but it's often something beyond that that they need. But anyway, yeah. the, the, the starting point is often communication. Right? So yeah, so absolutely. Yeah. And, um, well, okay. So yeah, everyone comes in needing better communication skills. I have, a, I have referred clients to lots of different, um, books and tools over the years and I've created my own over the years. And often folks are there. I just see a lot of need for people that want actionable steps in like bite size, <laughs> um, five minutes, 15 minutes sort of activities they can do to help just tune up. Right. Like um, when we talk about the couples who are actually doing pretty well, um, but there's that one tricky argument they get into or they're doing pretty well in general. But when this one sexual um, disconnect happens, oof, it's so tricky to work through. And so I put together 30 of my favorite kind of go to <laughs> activities and tools that I walk people through. So almost like a worksheet and gave a little taste of like the theory of how this works or why this works. Um, and then, uh, because I just wanted more resources out there, frankly, that was a big part of it. And then the end of it comes around, the publisher asked me to come up with some sort of like uh, case studies, almost examples of how mm -hmm. people might apply the tools because well, the, uh, the other thing that happens, you know, this is so often people say, we're the only ones. Are we the only ones who we must be the only people who yeah. struggle with this? Right. Yeah, yeah. And all too often, that's not the case, right? Like the struggles are really pretty well shared um, yes. yeah. among a lot of people or there's huge similarities. And so that last section, largely my motivation was to help people know they're not at all alone in these struggles, most of us don't get great skills training in how to communicate in relationships. So, you know, here's some ideas and tools for yeah. your own. Yeah. It's funny. I'm hearing a lot of, a lot of the same things that went into writing my book. One of the things mm -hmm. I say over and over and over and over to people and have mm -hmm. to point them to a research resource and then actionable steps that just seems so important yeah. to me, right? Like this change is not just theoretical. It doesn't just happen like mm -hmm. sitting on our couch and talking. Right? Yeah. They do things. Yeah. And so often, like, there's so many great theory books out there um, that are rich and can be very validating for people. But I see more often than not, folks don't read a whole book, um, or they they might um, maybe on audiobook during their commute. Right. Like, it's not the same as actually having a, like a workbook action steps that they can apply just kind of relieving, right? Like you see your, yourself and your partner work through something. Okay. Oh, we're both invested in this. There's like yeah. a little relief there. Like, Oh, we're both showing up. We can do these hard things. And for a lot of folks, it's a nice compliment to actual couples therapy or relationship coaching to, to have something at home to be working on in addition to what you're working on with a professional. Yeah. And yeah. so may, this may seem like an, I don't know, an obvious question. I'm trying to think of the listeners here too, but tie this together your book focus on communication skills and practices and deepening intimacy or mm -hmm. increasing the safety that one might need to, mm -hmm. to be able to open up more right these are directly related it seems to me yeah yeah I mean we are trained in communication from very early on in our families and our schools and our and our early life relationships our first crushes and our dating relationships all of those are teaching us little lessons 
And so that's, they create our default settings, right? That we go forward with in relationships. I assume if we've, we've been on three dates that we are exclusive and we're not having sex with other people and we will likely be looking at uh, moving in together. Let's say this is my norm, my expectation, my default. We'll likely be looking at moving in together by um, the end of next year. Your norm and default expectation settings might be very <laughs> different, right? Like we've been on three dates together. That was a fun time. I hope we go on another one, right? Like maybe, right, right, right. Maybe we will, maybe we won't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And if we're dating each other, that could lead to some conflict if we're, you know, because so often we go forward with our default settings, assuming everyone else is running with the same defaults as ours. Right. And, and in relationship, that's just not the case. Our, we choose people who have sometimes very different settings than our own and communication is how we bridge that gap. And I do a lot of work around, you know, physical intimacy uh, with people and still, you know, even when folks come in looking for work around sexual issues that might come up in a relationship, nine times out of 10, they're telling me communication is also something they've identified. And 10 times out of 10, I can help them find some way that their communication could just use a tune up, right? right like, right. yeah. yeah. And I, I guess I see people, you know, they come in all over the map. Some people have very, very strong communication skills and some people really don't. And what I mean by mm-hmm. that is there have, sometimes people are communicating in such a way that they're even causing harm, they're causing mm-hmm. disconnection and defensiveness. Like it's so hard to to work as allies that way. It's yeah. just fundamental in terms of building intimacy that you can treat each other <laughs> you know, respectfully, yeah. with compassion, all those things. And, and our communication yeah. is so important for that. Well, and so often our communication <laughs> um, gets mixed up in our emotional reactivity. Yeah. So the publisher actually asked me to start like right out the gate in the book with communication skills. And I made them let me add a section in the beginning about self-awareness and regulating intense emotions because I see so many people who are great communicators or they've been to tons of couples in relationship therapy and workshops and they, they really do know the skills and the theory so well. But in that moment, when they're jealous or insecure or um, feeling ashamed, whatever, like there's an intense emotion that erupts, those communication skills go right out the window. <laughs> right? <laughs> well, you know what? Even, even in addition to that, I feel like sometimes, <laughs> right, I think that, I'm trying to be careful about that. Um, <laughs> you can use the right words and the communication formula and say something, but if you're feeling something different, if that's not where you're coming from or where somebody is in their heart, those emotions, something different is going to get communicated, right? Yeah. So it can't be just formulaic, like I'm just going to use I statements if I can still manage to communicate, you know, energetically that it's yeah. you, 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 right? So that, yeah. that emotional regulation is so important. Yeah. Yeah. And um, when we come back to looking at what intimacy means, I think about there's like a recipe. I I felt like we practiced a lot in our graduate program, looking at the more specific I am about, about what I'm saying, right? So instead of like, this feels good, saying, I feel really comfortable right now. Um, I got a new chair. And I'm feeling more supported having this interview with you than I have felt in a long time. Wow, that is way <laughs> more detail, right? Yeah. Um, it's a, it, you can feel that it's a little bit more intimate what I'm sharing with you, right? Sharing from the first person. Like I just, I gave the example of like, this is great, is different than I feel this yeah. way, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, so getting specific and personal, direct and um, present are, that's sort of like a recipe I use with a lot of people to help break down how can we be how can we build more intimate connection with each other and those ingredients work in a sexual context they work uh, over dinner they work in the morning when I'm brushing my teeth next to you right and they worked um, in our graduate cohort I mean they, uh, they I was say it, works, it probably works with your children with your coworkers, right communication is sort of across the board it's gonna be different with our partner or different topics but the skills are important everywhere. Yeah, absolutely. So are you willing to share maybe your favorite exercise from the book? Oh like, do you want to, or maybe, or maybe I won't make you pick a favorite. It's like your children or something. Right? Like, <laughs> do you want, the first one that occurs to you that you would like to mm-hmm. 
Yeah. I mean, I think in the beginning, there are several reflections that unless folks have done a fair amount of therapy, it's not likely you've really thought of, thought through some of these, right? So when we look in communication, some of what we look at and building trust are clarity of boundaries, having a clear and um, compassionate accountability process, trust and stability or reliability in relationships. And I started the book by asking folks to think about what what lessons did I learn about boundaries from in my family of origin? What did my parents model for me about reliability and stability in relationships? What did my parents model for me about trustworthiness, right? What were the overt and covert lessons I got about being accountable in relationships? And, you know, for a lot of folks I've worked with over the years, as we start to unpack some of those lessons, oh, it's no surprise. Those are themes that are coming out in my current partnership, right? Yeah. Several of them, if not if not all, but many of them are key lessons I've learned that created these default settings. And simply having the awareness of them helps me start to sit in more intentionality of like, oh, I'm doing that thing. My mom taught me boundaries work this way. Now I'm expecting that in my marriage. Um, I can at least name like, oh, that's my default helps me know it's not the only way to be, right? That's not necessarily the right way to be, uh, which is an important lesson for me personally. It's not always the right way to be. <laughs> and it's not the only way it helps me have a little bit more room for curiosity and adjustment or to work with my partner around that. Yeah. 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 So I, I like that. I like starting there. And I think unpacking some of those early life lessons really does help us have clearer perspective about what's driving my, my actions and my interests now as a, as an adult. Yeah. Yeah. So where can people find the book, find more of what you have to offer? How, you know, how do they reach out when they're inspired by this episode? Well, um, they can find my book anywhere you find your favorite books. It was Penguin Random House published it and they are kind of a big publisher. So they've, it's all over the place. It's on Amazon. It's at Powell's. It's my favorite indie bookstore where you find your books. Um, and you can go to <laughs> Penguin Random House to find which like local seller near you might have it. I like to support the local businesses when we can. Yeah. And then if they want to find me. My website's heygina.com. And I also have another that's nonmonogamous.com um, where folks who really want to focus on that specific conversation can find me there. But either way, hey, Gina or non-monogamous, they'll find me. And then I, too, have a podcast called Spoon that uh, where a colleague of mine, Julie Jeske, and I talk about sex and relationships and intimacy. And so wherever folks find their podcasts, they can find Swoon and find me there. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for taking the time. Thanks for having me. It's really fun. You've been listening to Better Sex. Please visit our website, bettersexpodcast.com, for show notes and additional episodes. And that's a wrap for today. I really hope you enjoyed the episode. If you are enjoying the podcast, if some of this material resonates with you and you would like to make a difference and make sure that this keeps coming out in the world once a week, ongoing, there are a couple things you could do to show your appreciation. The first would be to go to iTunes and rate and review the show. That really helps us be found by new listeners when you review the show on iTunes. You can find a link at bettersexpodcast.com slash iTunes. The other thing I want to invite you to consider is becoming a Patreon. For a small monthly pledge, you get some benefits. So for $2 a month, you get advance access to every single episode. For $5 a month, you get a chapter of my upcoming new book. And for $10 a month, I host quarterly get to know you and question and answer chats over the web. And you get invited to that. I would love to have your membership in that become part of the Better Sex family. You can find a link at bettersexpodcast.com slash Patreon, which is P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Again, thanks for listening. I'm glad you're here. Feel free to comment, ask questions, get in touch. I'd love to hear from listeners. Thanks. Thanks.